So our co-host today is is Rick Warland or Eric. Is your real name Eric? My real name is Eric, but I, I've never gone by that. So I've always been Rick, yeah. Oh. <laughs> so I've known Rick for a long, long time. Uh, mm. He's been teaching at SMU uh, in their film program and teaches cinema studies and uh, at one time was chair of the department yes yes and luckily is not anymore very <laughs> correct yes all that's true yeah. and uh tell me tell us tell everybody about that, some of the books that you've written uh well i've written two so far and i'm supposedly at work on a third but uh the first book i published uh in 2006 was called the horror film and introduction and it was a survey of the genre um part of about a uh, third or more of it is history and a straightforward narrative history uh, briefly and the other parts are close analysis and discussions of greatest hits from different decades from the 1920s up through I think where I, I really left off talking about the ring in uh -huh. 2002 so it really was born out of the fact that I've been teaching the survey of the horror film and I've always loved the genre and science fiction and fantasy but there wasn't a good book as far as I was concerned. And what, I think what the, what the tipping point for me was one day years ago, I spent about 10 minutes in class one day summarizing the career of Lon Chaney Jr. And upon doing that, I realized, no, I think I should just get this down <laughs> and not have to actually do this in class and contextualize Lon Chaney Jr. somewhat different. And your second book? Oh, and the second book is called... Um, uh, searching for New Frontiers, Hollywood Films in the 1960s. And although I didn't talk about Night of the Living Dead much at all in that book, um, it's, uh, it's also designed as a kind of overview of, of a lot of the popular films and genres and the beginning of the new Hollywood um, in the 60s uh, as well. And I actually didn't talk about horror very much because, uh, because I'd already written the other book. And I'm working on a sequel to that book uh, which is Hollywood in the 70s, which of mm. course is everyone's favorite nowadays. Um, but actually in the meantime, before that, I kind of got de uh, derailed a bit on that because they, the uh, publisher, uh, Wiley Blackwell, wanted me to do an updating of the horror film book. And so uh, I'm mm. now looking at horror films from 2005 to present that I had not paid much attention to. Uh, and there, there's of course been in the 15 years or so, there's been a lot of changes and a lot of really interesting stuff going on. Uh, and so that's been enjoyable too. So um, why don't we, um, what's interesting is that, that your two books like intersect with this film in a sense, except that it's not really Hollywood film from the 60s. So can you sort of put, as we start this discussion, put this film in the perspective of horror film, like as horror films are, where does that sort of fit in? And in the scapes, in, in like 1968, it's this incredibly fascinating year. Right. It's fascinating for cinema. It's fascinating for the United States. So, so you want to try and sort of where this fits in those two realms. Oh, well, it's important in both of those two realms. When I was writing the book, uh, which took a while because I was chair doing part of that process, I kept coming back to several touchstones for references as I would go forward. And, there, and the, the touchstones for me were the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, which is here behind which me. Which is behind you. And <laughs> yes. by the way, Rick, you got somebody in the comments section said, love your background. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I sometimes say this is the street I live on. Uh, <laughs> it's very similar. Uh, and, and the others were Frankenstein, uh, the original 31 Frankenstein, um, Hitchcock Psycho, and Night of the Living Dead. And I kept coming in sort of a compare and contrast because those were really foundational, important movies um, for, the, for the development of the genre, but also for the, de for the development of Hollywood. I mean, I, I said out loud in the 60s book what I'd always thought for a long time, which was it's increasingly clear to me that Psycho is the key Hollywood film of the 1960s. And it really sets the pattern for so much of the changes that are going to be, they're, they're going to take a little while to show up, but they do begin to show up in the late 1960s. So Rick, uh, let me yeah. interrupt you for a second. Just a, another thing about Psycho. You know, I'm working on this film about Andrew Saris. Mm -hmm. Andrew Saris's first column in the Village Voice was a review of Psycho. 
Oh, is that right? And they got more comments, both positive and negative, than any review they'd ever run. Mm -hmm. That's, that's uh, well, that's a pretty good way to start a career, at least back in those days, anyway. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, Psycho was just, it was just a watershed film in, in all sorts of ways. Uh, and not the least of which was the level of violence uh, in the movie, uh, and especially uh, the, what was particularly shocking for audiences in 1960 was the fact that that graphic violence was being inflicted on a woman. And you don't see anything like that. It was so shocking that you don't really see anything approaching that until the climax of Bonnie and Clyde mm. in 1967, after which all bets are off. Uh, on, on that front, but just the, the but Psycho is doing uh, more graphic violence, but also it's a revision of the of the horror genre in certain ways. And then, Night that, of the Li yeah, go ahead. And that takes us to Night of the Living Dead. It, yeah, and Night of the Living Dead was part of. Um, well, there's a, a lot of trends when I talk about post-war Hollywood. Uh, and talk about the 1960s and 70s, the things, the, it goes back to the 50s. And the, the really key thing to get students to try to understand is that prior to World War II, there was this fairly homogenous and certainly a mass audience for Hollywood movies. Whereas after the war, because of industry changes, because of social changes, the American movie audience split into three overlapping, slightly overlapping factions and those and based on exhibition. So it was still the mainstream audience that would go to see Marilyn Monroe and John Wayne and whoever uh, in, in Hollywood studio pictures. Uh, the, the international art cinema heavily from Europe, but also Japan and other places. Uh, and so the art house, uh, art houses began to proliferate after World War II. And the third uh, segment was the drive-in audience for uh, which heavily programmed exploitation movies made by uh, not the major studios, independent producers, small fry producers, uh, and others. Uh, it's people distributing foreign films, including the spaghetti westerns from Italy, the Japanese giant monster movies, etc. So Night of the Living Dead really uh, falls into this period uh, that what we also see, and my friend and colleague Kevin Heffernan can probably talk about this a little bit later, what we also see in that period is a certain kind, and which makes it fascinating, is that we see a certain kind of um, problem with shoehorning films into pre-selected categories, that sometimes there are movies that were hard to, that, that distributors and exhibitors were hard pressed to say, is this an art film? Is this an exploitation movie? Is this a, some sort of low budget, um, you know, sex thing? Or is it an experimental film? Uh, it certainly isn't mainstream, we can agree on that. But what's really interesting about um, that this period in the 1960s and into the golden age of the new Hollywood in the 70s, is that all those categories get mixed and matched up in different ways that what constitutes an art film, uh, uh, an exploitation movie, an adult sex uh, cinema film, um, a European art cinema film, an exploitation movie, all these, and then Hollywood starts picking it up uh, with movies like 2001, which was an expensive movie, and Easy Rider, which was a cheap movie. And what they have in common is the fact that they're both drawing on some of the narrative models of the European art cinema. Um, and so then, then the other trend that I talk about uh, in the 60s is that it starts with the Western, actually, that there is a strong tendency towards the revision of traditional genres so that you would invert um, the conclusions of, of traditional genres. You would not have them have the characters act in ways that would be um, anticipated and just sort of manipulating, playing with, uh, or just completely inverting the conventions of familiar genres was one of the things that really makes that era uh, so exciting. And then through this, we get this film that comes out of Pittsburgh of all places. And, mm -hmm. and even, you know, most of those films in the 60s, you know, the um, uh, Easy Rider, Putney Swope, um, and, um, uh, 
uh, just uh, some of the other films of that era um, were made in made with in Los Angeles or around Los or certainly with Hollywood filmmakers. This, in a sense, predates the sense of regionalism, like slacker and uh, you know films that are made outside of New York or or, or uh, Los Angeles, but clearly sort of fits into a horror genre, but also creates new sub horror genre at the same time. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, my speaking of Pittsburgh, my favorite uh, review of this film years ago, I read someone described Night of the Living Dead as the most frightening movie ever made in Pittsburgh. <laughs> and, and I think it held that title probably until he did uh, Dawn of the Dead about 10 years later. Um, yeah, and- but yeah, it, it was completely an independent film made by people who were veteran industrial and commercial filmmakers in and around the Pittsburgh area. And and that's one of the things that watching it again, um, I mean, it's clearly um, these people knew cinema craft. They were not great craftsmen, but they were aware, wide shot, medium shot, close up, they knew film language. So it's not like young kids going out and like rediscovering, you know, things by themselves. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that, that and because these people had done industrials. And did you know that George Romero did films for uh, Mr. Rogers? I I knew he had made a bunch of different kinds of films and almost everyone who worked on the film were his, were his colleagues and friends in in this company. And they were also shooting, they had an, they had a infrastructure based around their production house, which was they, they shot 35 millimeters. And yes. they, they had their own editing room and they, they did their own sound work and they had a small studio uh, in the basement of the building that they were uh, working in. In fact, I just recently learned that all the basement scenes in Night of the Living Dead were not shot at the farmhouse because the farmhouse where most of the film was, uh, was shot, it had a cellar or a basement, but the ceiling was too low and there just wasn't enough space. So they went back to the basement of their production office in Philadelphia and built that set. And and a lot of it was just using the unfinished walls of the basement, which is completely great. So, I mean, but nonetheless, it's a low budget film that cost under $10,000. And, but, but what they really had that a lot of, you know, guerrilla filmmakers don't have, which they weren't, um, was they did have a basic kind of equipment infrastructure and, and some and quite a bit of experience from making commercials and industrials. And a lot of time. I mean, from what I read, it was like nine months of production. I mean, they'd shoot and then stop and then shoot, it, which is like you run out of money and then you shoot yeah. a little more. Well, they would shoot and stop and go back to their day job, which was <laughs> making the making commercials. Yeah. And And, but, you know, it's like, that you could do that with this film, you know, there's, there's, you know, you don't have to shoot it in in sequence. Mm -hmm. Um, All right. So before we go any further, we have to deal with the issue of race, Mm -hmm. um, which is really sort of fascinating. Look at the film now, as opposed to when it was made, because um, you're an expert. I'm not. Are there any other male, African-American leads in horror films? No, and (laughs) basically no. Uh, And of course, this was the period in which the one and only African-American movie star was Sidney Poitier. And Sidney Poitier starred in eight pictures that were released by major studios. And you know, they, those were Hollywood movies and Sidney Poitier was a Hollywood star. Uh, But no, in, in the horror genre, there just wasn't anything like this. What's always been kind of fascinating and frustrating to me is the fact that over the years, George Romero gave varying responses to when asked about, was this, did you cast Dwayne Jones deliberately? Did you realize the implications of this, et cetera? And sometimes he said things like, well, you know, we were in Pittsburgh, not LA or New York, and we didn't have access to a deep pool of acting talent. He was the best person we saw. Other times, um, they didn't apparently didn't interview or audition many people at all. Uh, they had a friend who was part of their group that was going to play the Ben character, who was white. And, and then a friend of a friend said, 
I know <laughs> my friend knows this actor from New York who's working in theater in New York and he's here in Pittsburgh visiting family. He could, you should talk to him. And so when he came in, they liked it. At different points, Romero has said, uh, we didn't change the script at all and we didn't want to do it. But Dwayne Jones, the actor, wanted to have some more pointed racial dialogue in the film. At other points, he said almost the opposite, that we, I offered to change the script or let Dwayne Jones look over his lines and change them if he wanted to. And he said, no, I don't want to do that in that version of the story. Um, so it's really hard to say uh, how deliberate it was. I fully believe the fact that Dwayne Jones was better than their friend, <laughs> who wasn't really an actor. He was literally a college, George Romero's best friend from college. Um, and um, so I believe that. Uh, but it's real, I, to me, I, I think part of the great power of the film is precisely the fact that they never talk about the racial tension that's palpable in the film uh, and it's never spoken of. And, and to me, that's even better because I think that really makes the audience want to want to read into what's going on. But it's, there are a couple places where it's, it's really kind of key and, you know, profound. Um, you know, there's that moment when he slaps her. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when in cinema did you have an African-American slap a white woman? And, and, and again, this is 1968. Like, things were not as they are now. And that had to, at the time... Well, that's debatable, but go on. Well, <laughs> I guess things are burning in a similar kind of way. But certainly, the civil rights have gone have have certainly moved beyond where they where they um, where they were, and then the ending of the film. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know about you, but um, in looking at it again, um, it's like the 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 cops that head cop with the thing on him. You know, he's like uh, the way he's talking. He just kind of reminds me of the cops in the South that were, you know, hosing down and doing all those hard. I mean, it just, they look very similar. And, um, you know, you could sort of see it coming, even though you didn't want to. And, you know, it's really odd that this film doesn't have a happy ending. It's like everybody wants him to live. And, and did he ever talk about why he decided to end it this way? He said that was always the ending of the story. Before, before Dwayne Jones was, was cast, that was the ending of the story. And he, well, two things about the context. They shot most of the film in 1967 and were posting it in early, six, late 67, 68. And Romero has often said that when he was, he and one of his producer buds, who was also an actor in the film, were driving the print to New York to show to possible distributors, it was the day of the Martin Luther King assassination. And they heard it on the radio while driving to, uh, tri driving to New York City. And he said that, that they, one of the distributors they showed it to was Columbia, it was the mainstream Hollywood. And Columbia said, we really like this film. It's interesting, but you're going to have to change the ending and, and he's going to have to escape. And they said, no, it's not, that's not what we're going to do. Um, and so they held their, you know, they, they, they kept it up. And I think they wanted this very shocking ending. And there's so much in the film that, and I've, I've still shown this to students today and sometimes had people audibly gasp when Ben is shot at the end of the film. Um, I, I think for those of us <laughs> who grew up watching movies in that period in the late 60s and the 70s, I think we just expect the hero to fail or be killed or pathetically <laughs> die and alone and forgotten. Writer? Yes, exactly, exactly. I mean, basically the same thing. Yeah, well, it comes out, sort of comes out of nowhere. So we want to talk a little bit, and Kevin, maybe you can jump in here and talk about how this film got out into the world. Well, uh, just to, to uh, sort of piggyback on some of the great points that you guys just made, um, among other things, the movie is an unacknowledged, uh, uh, uncited 
adaptation of the Richard Matheson novel, I Am Legend, which, which was previously made in it's a, a, a Italian runaway production with AIP with uh, Vincent Price as uh, the sort of last man on earth, which is the name of that film. It was later remade as the Omega Man. Mm. And so the, uh, the idea that the, that the lone human survivor would be remorselessly executed by this, this interstitial group of people who weren't human, but they weren't the vampire zombies. Anyway, I mean, I mean, that was just kind of, that was sort of built into the architecture of the plot that they inherited. And if you look at the scenes of, uh, of Morgan, the Vincent Price character in Last House on, uh, Last House on the Left, sorry, Last Man on Earth, uh, boarding up the windows with the hands coming through the thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's clear that entire scenes were, were blocked in Night of the Living Dead as um, uh, certainly an un, uncredited um, uh, uh, homage or, or uh, uh, inspired response. Uh, to last man, a uh, last man on earth. Um, in terms of uh, regional genre cinema, it's important to know that in the years after World War II, the Hollywood studios were forced to sell their theaters and desist from certain monopolistic trade practices. And what this did was uh, the, the studio started investing heavily in new technology and they started uh, making fewer films at, with much higher budgets. And now that they weren't having to pay for the equipment upgrades to the theaters to show movies in widescreen, stereo sound, this division, 3D, whatever, um, uh, what what we started getting was you know a lot of people think about the 80s as this time of um, uh, excess and technological imbecility in American cinema and you know the the the, the rise of the tentpole feature and all that stuff but all of that was going on by the by the early 50s and so a lot of theaters ended up with these these horrible fallow periods where they basically didn't have any films to book. The big Hollywood films were screened in these extended first runs at confiscatory rentals. And this is where we, of course, begin to see the rise of the art cinema movement, the, uh, the, the, the efforts of American independent distributors and in some cases, uh, specialized uh, divisions of, of the major studios bringing in these, these foreign films this was this was an attempt to sort of fill in these fallow spots in the uh, in the release calendar. And one of the most important and successful of these uh, uh, of these companies that were bringing in films from abroad, particularly from the UK, was a company called Continental Distributing, which was was bankrolled by the Walter Reed Theater chain. They owned the Baronet in New York City, and they were. They were the big, big players in the in the international art cinema scene in the 1950s. Uh, uh, you know, other you know, uh, Universal brought in a lot of the Alec Guinness comedies. You know, with the, um, uh, but but the uh, like the, the early films of Lindsay Anderson, for example, those were uh, the, the Saint Trinian's films. All those movies were distributed by Continental, and uh, around. Uh, like by the early 1950s, the situation with, with uh, the, the drought was so severe that a number of exhibitor chains started getting into production financing. One of those was Continental. Uh, and, and in 1953 and, and later in 1956, the, the Senate Small Business Committee actually had hearings in which these independent theaters were insisting that the government regulate runs, clearances, and film rentals. And, you know, uh, you know where, where you think you are, boy, you think this is France? They, they turned that down, but what they did do was they offered incredibly 
generous tax credits to people who invested in feature film production. And, and uh, uh, so if, if, I'm an El pa if I'm a fertilizer salesman in El Paso <laughs> and I put $15,000 into a movie and that, that movie doesn't get finished or if it loses money, I can take off $70,000 on my taxes for this. And this is, this is the, real, the real rise of, of independent regional genre cinema. It, it actually is in full force before Night of the Living Dead. That, that uh, we, we, the classics like The Brain That Wouldn't Die, that was like financed by uh, like real estate people in Terrytown, New York. Uh, 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 Florida became this important hub of low budget independent genre cinema because uh, mm -hmm. because of the tourism industry, they had all these color labs. And so Florida became this, this uh, early uh, leader in, uh, uh, in, in color genre film production. The early films of John Waters were tax break movies for his dad's uh, fire extinguisher company. Uh, that I've Chains never heard before. You no, know, the, the, the Fireline Company. Uh, that was uh, uh, the, the, the his fur. Uh, uh, um, uh, Pink flamingos, female trouble, and uh, desperate living were all tax shelter films that his father paid for uh, to offset the profits of his fire extinguisher business. And, and um, they would have made money if they would have lost money. No, no, it, nobody wanted these movies to make money. Right, it, it's, like, it's like the producers. No, that is exactly, that is exactly, I mean, the producers is among many other, The Tingler is another movie like this. Uh, the producers is among many of its other qualities, a really mordant satire on film financing in the 1960s. That's, there are all kinds of inside jokes in the movie about, about the way these films are financed. Uh, the I, Texas Chainsaw Massacre was real estate and banking. And of course, uh, uh, because, because, the, because the people putting together Texas Chainsaw Massacre were utterly inept, they literally oversold the shares in exactly the same way that they did in the producers. Um, and so by the time we get to, by the time we get to Night of the Living Dead, uh, uh, like these guys are really ready to take their shots because Image 10, the, the production company, is, is essentially the 10 people who are working in this TV commercial firm. They put up their own money, the seed money. Right. Six hundred dollars. Okay. Six hundred dollars each. Right. Yes. So ten of them got six thousand. <laughs> okay. Okay. But once again, because of their high volume business with labs and yeah. equipment rental facilities, like <coughs> huge amounts of the, the budget could be deferred. Yeah. And uh, uh, and so so you know they 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 tried to figure out you know what are we going to do. And they, uh, 1965, 66 is the huge explosion in color TV, right? This is like, if you're making a black and white movie in 1967, you are at the bottom half of an all night drive in dust to dawn show. So they really had to do something wild. And of course, that's what they did. And, and two of the air, two of the, um, two of the, audiences of uh, uh, the, the, the audiences that uh, Continental was able to exploit in the mid to late 60s were the art film audience, the uh, social problem films about the race issue, mm -hmm. which were, which were um, um, you know, th there was a big, big controversy about whether they were, cons should be considered exploitation films or serious social problem films. And kitty matinees, uh, Continental, uh, 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 they uh, they brought in uh, Gidra, the Three-Headed Monster, and Doctor Who and the Daleks with Peter Cushing, and these movies made tons and tons of money for them at kitty matinees. And so they bring in this movie, they buy it. It's got an African American protagonist, so they can slot it into inner city theaters. It's got the horror thing going on, which is makes it kind of like Ghidra and Doctor Who. And of course, they, they 
insanely book it into huge numbers of Saturday afternoon kitty matinees. And that's when, that's when Roger so Ebert- that's when the film got really famous at that that's right, right, right. right. Roger, Roger Ebert, Ebert said that, she, that, she should not be watching this. Yeah, yeah, yeah but, but I, mean, I mean, you know, he saw it in, he saw it in a black movie theater at a kitty matinee when it came out. And he said, this is the most fucked up thing I've ever seen. <laughs> and, and it really became kind of a success to Scandal. Um, uh, and and uh, in, in a real, you know, in a real sort of tragic idiot move, um, because Romero and John Russo and, and Carl Hardman, because they read too many books, they called the movie The Night of Anubis. Anubis was the Egyptian god of the underworld. Mm -hmm. And uh, Continental said, nobody's going to know what that is. It's like later when, when Woody Allen wanted to call Annie Hall like Anhedonia, right? Said, nobody's <laughs> going to get that. We're going to change the title to Night of the Living Dead. And, and Romero's like, okay, well, you know, you're, the, you're the experts here. You do that. And when they changed the title card, they neglected to put a copyright notice on it. And so this made the film de facto like public domain. Uh, and, and, and it became a mega, mega hit on college campuses and in East Asia in these gray market duped prints that carried no copyright notice. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the, the movie is so much a product of the massive instability in the film industry of the time. You know, and you got to hand it to the folks at Image 10. They really knew what they were doing when they said, we're going to make a movie that's not like anything anybody's ever seen. Mm -hmm. uh, what they forgot to say was, but let's try to get it distributed like normal movies that people have seen that might be successful. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Well, I think that the um, part, it's just, it, it was so much a part of that time in terms of, as you were just talking about, that kind of instability where it's not clear what constitutes a mainstream movie, what's the avant-garde, what's uh, an exploitation film. And that's why it's so, that era is so fascinating that you have movies like Easy Rider and Midnight Cowboy that come out in 1969 and uh, yeah. are picking up aspects of the art cinema of the avant-garde and telling the and European art cinema telling these stories in sort of disjointed fashion, especially Midnight Cowboy. So, I mean, there's just a lot of, things that go on in that period. And it just, there's also kind of a sense why, I, I think why that succeeded in that time is that there was this sudden, uh, I, this was the beginning of the idea, especially I think post Bonnie and Clyde, that anything goes, that we can really, and then also Night of the Living Dead comes out just before censorship ended, just before the rating system began in yeah. mm -hmm. late 68. And, and, and there are many things that people can attribute, you know, the themes in this film to what I've been reading. So some people talked about it as, you know, about really the Cold War. And then there are people who talked about it as, you know, symbolic of Vietnam, which one could sort of make a case for. Um, one could talk about it in the Manson family, you know, the, the murders. I mean, that's really kind of the race we talked about disillusion with, with the government, you know, the, the people on the radio aren't telling you anything on the television. And, you know, they've got this cockamamie story about, you know, some nuclear or something or other that nobody believes and nobody really kind of knows. And then you have uh, cannibalism and a critique of capitalism as, you know, of, you know, cannibalism. So all of these things, this is one film and you can throw so much into it that it's really kind of fascinating. Oh yeah, it really is. I mean, the iconography at the end of the movie of the of the sort of paramilitary posse, it yes, it, it evokes uh, the uh, sort of the Klan and and Southern police departments uh, attacking peaceful civil rights demonstrators, but it also looks very much like the iconography is, of the Vietnam War as mediated yeah. by television news. There's a news cameraman there with his yeah. with with a microphone in the in the officer's face. A helicopter lands in the background. It's a news helicopter, et cetera. Yeah. But it's it's really evoking that as well. And people have pointed out, and again, Romero's always been a little cagey about it, 
but in the opening scene of the film on the credits, his directing credit appears over a, a little flag that's been put on the grave of a book. And it says directed by George Romero, and we're looking at the little American flag there. Um, and so that really feels, I mean, again, 1968 was the Tet Offensive. This was the year of the highest U.S. casualties in war. There were a thousand U.S. casualties a week in 1967 and 68. Um, so yeah, there's just, uh, the film is so successful, I think in its time and beyond just because it's tapping a lot of different uh, elements all at the same time. Well, so, I, think so, it, I think it's the most influential work of popular culture of the late 20th century. I, I, I just, I, I can't, I can't imagine entire zones of popular music and comic books and television and the cinema that have not in some way uh, modeled themselves on or responded to, uh, you know, responded to the film. And um, uh, one of the things, you know, in terms of the iconography of the horror film, um, it, it, it represents the complete displacement of the Gothic motifs that had been the coin of the realm in horror films since the 1920s. The first scene in the movie is in a graveyard, and the second scene in the movie is a woman exploring these increasingly threatening spaces of this house. Yeah. So, so, so the 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 movie starts off activating all of these. Uh, generic conventions and and bits of iconography and and I, you know, I would argue that when that basement door opens and we find there's another group of people in the house and that these people are going to be more of a threat to each other than the marauding ghouls outside I mean I, I think I think we can we can actually watch the horror genre kind of turning on a dime at that moment, the, the, the beginning of act two, that close up of the door. Think about all those horror movies that have the door, right? You know, that thing. And, uh, uh, you know, I just, uh, once again, uh, the, the filmmakers were very cagey. They were very opportunistic. And, and the, the very instability of the terrain in which, you know, on which they were trying to like practice their craft uh, I mean, all of these things that that were potentially commercially um, uh, debilitating were in fact aesthetically enabling, mm -hmm. which is what's really a you know one of the sort of really to me revolutionary aspects of the film. Mm -hmm. that, that that if it had been a box office hit and the filmmakers would have gotten rich. That's not a story I want to tell. Well, the, it was a box office hit, and the filmmakers didn't get rich. Right. So that, that's my point, right? And yeah. the same yeah. thing happened with the same thing happened almost you know, all, virtually a very similar production circumstance with with Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah, well, as a matter of fact, Brian Stark started the rights to, to Night of the Living Dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, it, it's worth sort of talking for a moment about zombies as a thing, right? Um, there is no place in this film where anybody is mentioning the word zombie. Yet this film is the beginning of the zombie film. Isn't Why that is that? Crazy? <laughs> I, I actually about, oh, seven, eight years ago or so, there was a program that was done, uh, I think, through one of the film festivals or in conjunction with the Texas Fright Fest, Frightmare, what's it called? Frightmare, Frightmare, Frightmare yeah. Weekend, yeah. They had George Romero and a lot of the people who worked on Night of the Living Dead were at the um, at the Inwood Theater, and I and I was yeah. there, I was happy to say. Um, and um, one of the things that I remember Romero saying very definitely was, he said, you know, we never used the word zombies making this movie. We, we called them ghouls or yeah. flesh. And I was, I was watching a documentary about the 
production of the film and they were interviewing different people who had worked on the movie, including some who were sort of civilians who were extras. And they would, they all, they kept saying ghouls. I was one of the ghouls. I did the, this for the ghouls. This is what the ghouls looked like, et cetera. So, you know, it, it just, that idea of the, of the zombies as a, as a horde uh, was a, was a new thing. And again, it really was born out of um, the Richard Matson novel, I Am Legend. Yeah. And which itself was steeped in the Cold War. And so previous to that time, the, the first Hollywood movie that mentioned this, of course, was White Zombie from 1932, which was a low budget movie with Bela Lugosi. And th that's the based on the kind of uh, practices of Haitian voodoo in which there's one master who physically controls or is able to, through supernatural means, control the dead and a, you know a few of the dead but what those narratives often the zombie narratives often have in common um, that ties this together is is two things and, and those two things are war and race and um, it, it that keeps recurring in all the different versions of um, I am legend of Night of the Living Dead and these various other zombie movies it's war and race again and again yeah, yeah. colonialism yeah. specifically. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about the um, the the rest of the uh, the Dawn of the Dead and the you know the the, the rest of the series? Uh, which one of those do you like? Which one of those do you hate? There's something nice about having a horror film in a mall that I think is kind of a yeah. thing. Um, I just recently watched. Um, I haven't seen. I will confess that I have not seen the. I have not seen the last two or three that, that he did. I haven't seen them at all. Um, I, I did see all of the original ones through. Um, was it the Day of the Dead? And I just recently watched uh, Dawn of the Dead for probably the first time in fifteen or twenty years or so, and I think it's a really good film. And, and it's similar to what. Um, similar to what happened with perhaps Bride of Frankenstein compared to Frankenstein or Aliens compared to Alien. They took the same characters and the same basic givens and did a completely different approach to the story. And I think, um, I think Dawn of the Dead is a really impressive film. And it's also another movie that was very influential uh, on the uh, slasher and all the uh, gore films that were made in the 80s using, using practical effects. Um, and that, that, by the way, I've found, I don't know if you've had this experience, Bart, but a lot of today, my students are really interested in, I think they've been digitally saturated and they're really interested in well-made horror, science fiction, fantasy stuff from the 80s. And maybe even not so well-made, but that, it, that has practical effects. Right. And a lot of times they will say Dawn of the Dead or they will say the, the John Carpenter version of The Thing. Uh, amazing they'll say and, and then I show them uh, reanimator and they don't know what to say um, but they uh, those those films I think Dawn of the Dead was really influential and part of that whole part of that whole change was signaled by making the makeup artists like Tom Savini uh, who worked with Romero and others making the makeup artists into auteurs in a sense and that they were being promoted as auteurs in their own rights and special effects people and so on. And I think in this film, I mean, it, it is very sort of home crafty. I mean, you've got mm -hmm. um, chocolate syrup for blood. And uh, I think I read someplace that um, somebody in the production had a butcher shop. So that's where they got all the all the stuff from. And, you know, the makeup on them the was really kind of great. But one of the things that I sort of didn't click on me the first time I saw it is because these, these, uh, these zombies or ghouls, as they're called in the film, all died like our, right, right after they died. They all have different levels of clothes on. <laughs> like some of them are fully dressed and some of them just have underpants and like people have whatever they died in, which is really kind of funny. Yeah, and that actually becomes funny, like in a, a movie that I really like, the comedy Shaun of the Dead. Oh, yes. That, that becomes one of the sort of jokes that the people are they're in their work clothes or they're in their bathrobes or just however they died. Yes, that's exactly what they're wearing because now they don't need to worry about clothing anymore. You know, it's like your mother said, wear clean underwear. You don't ever know. <laughs> you die. <laughs> hey, well, they sure an accident. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, and the, and the fact that they they gen and Donald that they 
they uh, generously populate uh, uh, the zombies with members of various religious orders, uh, oh. Marianist priests and, and Carmelite nuns and stuff like that. They had a lot more budget then. I think. Yeah, yeah. So, Rick, let me ask you this. Um, I, I assume you watched it again recently. How does looking at this film now different than when you looked at it back when you saw it the first time? How do, how do you I, feel about it? I, I didn't actually see this movie till I was probably in college. Um, so it was close to 10 years or so after it came out. And I was always sort of, I remember distinctly hearing the radio commercials uh, for the film and just being night of the living dead and just being sort of frightened by that. And I, and I li always liked horror films, but um, I, I think when I, I was always kind of afraid <laughs> of this movie because they would uh, in the old uh, famous monsters of Filmland magazine of which I was a devoted reader, they always sold all kinds of paperback books and, and assorted collector stuff in the, in the back pages. And just there was that, that poster uh, and the cover of the novel was all the fingers like reaching out, you know, coming at you and so on. I just yeah, I thought, man, that's pretty scary. And so when I finally saw it, I went, it's pretty scary indeed. And it's also so well made. And it's a movie very much like Texas Chainsaw Massacre around the same period. I can watch it again and again and be just marveling at how well made it is on such simple relatively low budget, quite low budget and relatively simple means. Okay, but that was not the reception. The reception was, it. remember that poorly lensed Pittsburgh flick, right? <laughs> you know, that, 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 that this film, Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Pink Flamingos are, are three examples of, of, of movies that were seen as the end of the world, the end of the civilized world, that that these these are so depraved and they're so inept that, that the uh, uh, it, what's that line from the Variety review that that this movie casts serious moral uh, aspersions on its makers, on its distributor, it. it's the theaters who book the movie and the audiences who show up. <laughs> you know, so it's really just yeah. yeah. Right. It's just, it couldn't go, it couldn't go any worse. No, I, I think that was very, very common for, you know, reviewers on a deadline to just be basically incapable of dealing with the formal elements of films. Um, and a lot of times, and so again, these, this film is, uh, this film and, and uh, Chainsaw Massacre, these are tangibly well-made films on, on very limited means. And you can, I, I'll disagree with anybody about that. I mean, there's, there's such a, watching these two films again and again and again over the years, I'm always amazed at how technically sophisticated they really are or narratively sophisticated. I mean, you know, I, I think the performances are probably better on the whole in Texas Chainsaw Massacre. That would be my completely subjective take. But at the same time, just these films are so gripping, they're well edited, they're beautiful use of shot composition and lighting and mise-en-scene, and um, they're as sophisticated as, and more sophisticated than uh, films that have many times their budget. And, and I, I, I totally agree, but it doesn't have the sort of slickness that say Easy Rider does. No. Um, but Easy Riser sure. was shot, you know, by one of the great cinematographers of our time. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this was shot by people who do industrials and commercials, mm -hmm. you know. And because of that, they know how to do something, but it didn't have that slickness to it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in those days, there wasn't a lot of, I mean, it was emerging. There were more things like that. And Medium Cool, that's another one, I think, mm -hmm. that sort of fits in that, although that was shot by a famous cameraman as well. A famous DP, yeah. And I, I think that part of that sense of why this movie was so, and all those films in the late 60s, early 70s in the horror genre were so disturbing was because they had seemingly moved away from that kind of studio bound expressionism and 
sophisticated lighting and um, these look like re this look quote real this looked like this was actually happening in a place you could recognize and and wasn't this kind of uh, self-contained expressionistic world uh, i'm a big fan i know kevin is too of the roger corman vincent price edgar Allan poe movies mm. and those movies are made on a limited budget of about two uh, of 250 to three hundred thousand dollars which was nothing compared to hollywood budget but more but, than this was made with. But a lot more than this was made from, and they were drawing on Hollywood infrastructure. Um, right. And and again, I, I admire those films for the fact that among other things, Roger Corman always said, I want these movies to not, I don't want to see reality. I want to build everything and you know, put the audience in this gothic world. And Night of the Living Dead does that too. But, but since it's, again, it's people <laughs> in their underwear and old suits and shuffling all into this actual real Pennsylvania farmhouse, um, it just that sense of reality is just strips away the distance. And that's part to me, I think that's one of the reasons it was so disturbing. The last Gordon, house that left is, is the sort of ne plus ultra of that kind of aesthetic, I think. Mm -hmm. Gordon, you had a few comments that you posted here. You wanna, you wanna talk yeah. about any of them? Well, probably too many comments, but <laughs> love your say, carry poster, man. What's that? Love your carry poster. Oh, oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, awesome. Yeah, I first saw Night Living Dead at a drive-in in Lubbock. The second feature was a Hammer film, Night Creatures, mm -hmm. of '62, and uh, Night of Living Dead had more strange co-features than any other movie I could <laughs> think of at the drive-ins, and when it when it played at the Grand House first in the indoor at Lubbock, the co-feature was Doctor Who and the Daleks, which mm. I, the one with Peter Cushing, which I guess is, was by the same distributor. Uh, my question might be for you, for for Rick and, and you guys, do you think that, um, you know, I have a personal connection with Carnival of Souls. Uh, to to uh, Long story short, I played a big part in getting that movie resurrected. Mm. I think that's also which was released in 62. I think right. it's a big influence, although in various interviews, I, I heard Romero both confirm and deny that. I guess he was, <laughs> I guess that was a habit of his, but yeah. I think there's certain parts of that film that, uh, that again, that real dreamlike black and white, oh, yeah. Uh, world that, that both of those exist in. Uh, when the, the, the mod, the cadaverous makeup is yeah, clearly yeah. transposed from Carnival of Souls to the to the the, 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 the ghoul extras in Night of the Dead. And I guess we would have to say that Carnival of Souls is one of the most frightening movies ever made in Lawrence, Kansas. So. In Lawrence, Kansas. <laughs> <that yeah>. <laughs> Uh, Candace Hillegas and me are still friends to this day. We see oh, that's wonderful. Each other. Oh, yeah, she's great. I think that's an easy one to overlook as a precedent, but I think you're exactly right, because it was the two guys who made that were industrial filmmakers, and they, they made commercials, and yeah, yeah. that's exactly. Except they were going for the art cinema style look. I mean, it was often compared to Bergman and... Yeah, Night that, was the only, that was the only feature that her Carvey ever made. Uh, and I got to know him real well, too. He died in 96, but he never made another feature. Mm. And, the, and where he and Romero, of course, diverged, Romero went on to make a lot of other features. Mm. But I did hear that um, he could never get budgeting to do anything other than horror movies, mm. which is too bad. You know, he did a few different things, but not many. It would have been interesting to see what else he could have done. Yeah. So he, he initially he wrote those two female-centered countercultural dramas. Um, uh, There's always Vanilla, and the other one, Jack's Wife. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. No. He, he, his his plan was to never make another horror movie again. He wanted to make social. He wanted Romero. To make, I mean, Romero. Romero yeah. wanted to make female-centered social dramas. That's what he wanted to do. Did not work out for him. <laughs> okay, but, 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 but Dawn of the Dead has a lot in common with those two females, those sort of understated female-centered dramas that he did right after Night of the Living Dead. I mean, he, uh, uh, he, 
he tried to figure out how to bring some of those elements into the movies so he could get money to make. So, uh, go on. Uh, I was I, at that I, screening at the Inwood Theater oh. in 2008, and I'll, I'll never forget um, George Romero and the people from the film getting a Q&A from Malcolm McDowell. Yes, the yes. Space. And they were all drunk as hell, I think. And it was just, it, it was, McDowell had never seen it, wasn't familiar with it. It was, it was. It was a memorable it, evening. I thoroughly it was, enjoyed it. Yeah. And, and my, t Tom Savini wasn't on stage with him, but he was in the house and stood up and took a bow. And I thought, oh man, good stuff. Yeah. So uh, Kevin and Rick, are, I assume you show this to your students. How do oh. students respond to, to this film now? And, and, and when they, when you show it, is this the first time they've seen it or heard about it? Increasingly, it is that they've heard about it. Of course, they know Night of the Living Dead and Texas Chainsaw Massacre, whether they've seen them or not, uh, in the same way that they know Frankenstein. Um, but again, I, it's, fu it's fun to show it to a larger group of 20 or 30 people, because as I always tell them, you know, horror films are made to be all movies, but horror films play best with audiences. Comedies play best with audiences. I'm not, uh, you can't, put up a, a comedy, so yeah, I watched this on my phone last night and it wasn't funny, and that doesn't mean anything <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. But anyway, I've, it's always fun to show these films that I've seen a hundred thousand times and just hear, watch people react, just listen and watch people's reaction. And I had a particularly great experience showing uh, more, it was, uh, it was actually Chainsaw Massacre a few years, or just two, a couple of years ago. And I mean, I, the students were talking back to the screen. They were visibly squirming and moving around. And I'm going, yeah, this is, it this works. is why I'm in this, this line of work. So to show them this kind of stuff. All right, so, so um, you show this in class and I'm sure you have, what would a question about this film on a final exam be? <laughs> and I want this from both you and Kevin. And we'll see if anybody in this room can answer the question. <laughs> it's a oh, Andrew, you're, you're, my for, you're my former chair. I you would you, I would usually put it in the context of saying something like, talk about how Night of the Living Dead or Chainsaw Massacre uh, differs from the classical model of the horror film. That should really be the softball question. Mm. I, I think we kind of addressed that, didn't we? I think we did, yeah. All right, and so we, we all no get it. All night. He drives a stake in anyone's heart, and we Deke. feel better about it when the sun comes up. Yeah. Yeah, Deke. Yeah, Bart. Can, can I ask something? Yes, you can. The um, about ten or twelve years ago, the Dallas Children's Theater did a stage production of Night of the Living Dead. Oh my! Yes, I remember oh my. reading about that. Yes, and yes, they, yes. I think they recommended it for junior high and up, but. Um, yeah, you know, again, like I started driving in 1970. It was the third feature that we, it was the third unannounced feature, and we were about to leave. And and you know, one one of the two or three people in the car said, "Oh, this is supposed to be pretty scary," and we had no idea what we were getting into. But is the fate of something like this to be like sort of a family Halloween favorite, the way that? Uh, it's a wonderful life is the Christmas Halloween favorite. Yeah. Well, yeah, they watch it on TV. What and family over there? Yeah. Well, it, yeah. it's, it's shown a lot. Watch. It's shown a lot because it's free. It's public domain. Yeah, no, well, so yeah. was, uh, it's a wonderful life. It was right. public domain as well. Yeah. I mean, it's got to be incredibly frustrating to make a film that gets shown a lot. And because the idiots oh. put a bug on it, you don't get any money. That's like... Since I actually heard, yeah, oh, frustrating. Yeah, I mean, Romero and Toby Hooper both got pretty good careers that followed from that. Uh, but it was, uh, yeah, they, they should have cleaned up. I mean, the, absolutely. And, and they didn't. I mean, I, and I also remember reading an interview with Richard Matheson, uh, who said that he was eventually at some point he was introduced to Romero or they were on a program together or something. And According to Richard Matheson, George Romero walked up to him, and the first thing he said was, I didn't make a dime off of it, believe me. Yeah. <laughs> that is unfortunately true. 
Well, guys, we are at 8.30, and I try not to make this longer than an hour. Um, Rick and, and Kevin, it was so wonderful to have both of you uh, teaming up on this, and the knowledge has been just really kind of wonderful, and I really thoroughly um, enjoyed this. Um, just so everybody knows, next week we move to Wednesday instead of Thursday, because next week, uh, Kevin and and Rick and I are go back to teaching, and I have a Thursday night class. So um, we'll be doing good in a hazmat suit. Right? Yeah, 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 right. I'll do a hazmat suit. So, guys, thank you, thank you all very much. Uh, they, I, I really thoroughly enjoyed this, and uh, we'll see you next week on Wednesday. Thank, thank you, everybody, guys. for coming. Thanks, thank thanks, you. Rick. That was oh. great. Job. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. I, I thoroughly right. enjoyed it. It was really great.